Kathleen, thank you so much for joining me today. I am so excited to be here, Chris. Thanks for having me. So this is really exciting for me because actually I put my hands up and when we first were introduced, uh, I said, I have no idea. I need help with this. Um, but we're going to be talking about something that is completely new to me. So we're going to be talking about uh, engagement security when it comes to online, when it comes to marketing and what everything that we do. But before we jump into that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you're currently doing? Sure. So Kathleen Booth, I am currently VP of marketing at a company called clean.io, which is based in Baltimore, Maryland in the U S um, I, my background is that I, I owned a digital marketing agency for 11 years. And so I, I spent a long time working with companies across a wide variety of industries. Uh, we were really focused on demand gen, um, and it was great. I exited that in 2017. And after, from then until now, have really been working in B2B technology as head of marketing. So I, I wanted to do a stint in-house as a marketer. Um, I always said, funny enough, when I had my agency, if I only had to market one company, I could really crush it. And now I'm marketing one company and I still feel overwhelmed. So it's no different than when I was in an agency, but, um, but it's been fun in my industry experience you know, is, is quite broad, but it includes uh, a lot of work with cybersecurity companies, which is really what led me to kind of the topic we're going to talk about today, because obviously I have a background as a marketer. And when I started working in cyber, doing marketing for cyber companies, it was like my eyes were open to how much I didn't know that really affected what I was doing as a marketer. So that's sort of what led me to where I am. So I'm putting my hands up and I'm saying, <laughs> I know nothing i don't think about what we're about to talk about so for everyone listening you're in the same boat as me or potentially you know more than me today but i'm really looking forward to try and understand this but can we start with literally the most basic question but what is engagement security what is it that we're talking about sure so where i am now at clean.io we we are building essentially a digital engagement security platform and um it's you know it's a concept that's new to a lot of people because as marketers, we're not taught about security. Um, and when I look at the world around me right now, the trends I see, particularly with COVID, are that more and more businesses are, are moving online, right? There's You have brick and mortar businesses that are really struggling to survive. And so they're having to shift their business models and e-commerce is growing like crazy and even B2B businesses, we're having to find ways of interacting with our audiences in the digital realm. Whereas prior to this, a lot of it was in person, whether that's trade shows or just meetings, what have you. So when, when we really started to think through this, we realized these points of digital engagement that we have with our customers and our audience are supplanting what used to be in-person interactions. And when you move your relationship into the digital world, it, it has different implications for how you manage that. So in the past, if somebody comes to your trade show booth or walks into your offices, part of what goes into creating the trust that needs to be there, right? That's what we're all selling at the end of the day is trust. Part of building trust is, do you have a nice office? What does your booth look like? How someone walk up to you and greet you at the door? Like those are all physical kind of aspects and interactions that you can control. In the digital world, you know, what you control is, is the experience surrounding that digital engagement. So whether that's somebody coming to your website and interacting with you there or somebody consuming your social content, those are all points of digital engagement and, and we have to look at them differently. And part of building trust online is creating a secure environment within which to engage with your audience, your customers, your, your users. So what are some of the ways that businesses can kind of secure that area? Because obviously social media is open, right? Anyone can write, comment, do whatever they want to do. But how does how do small businesses or B2B businesses in particular, how do they actually make this more of a secure environment, make it more of a safe environment? Sure. So I would say, you know, when, when I think about digital engagement security, it really falls into a couple of different buckets. And it starts with like the things that you control and the things that you don't, right? So when we're talking about your website, you have a lot more control there. When we're talking about social media, you have less control because the platforms upon which you're, you're building your social presence really own that that presence and they can change the rules of the game at any time. We all know that as marketers, um, but in terms of, of how you interact there, you know, you, you don't have any control over whether Twitter gets hacked, 
or Facebook gets hacked, you do have control over whether you set up two-factor authentication on your accounts. And that's certainly something that I see a lot of marketers um, not do. And, and it can be for a variety of reasons. It might be because they don't take it seriously and they don't think, you know, they're like, ah, oh, who would want to hack us, right? You know, we're just a little company here in this town. Nobody's looking out for us. Or it might be because they're sharing passwords. Like you might have multiple people on your team that are managing the Twitter account, or you might be sharing it with an agency or an outsourced contractor. You know, you really need to put on two-factor authentication so that you can maintain control of your account, you know, use a secure password manager to, to make sure nobody else has access. That's like the basics, right? Uh, that's the starting point. But the really more interesting thing about social media, and this was where I started to really have my eyes open when I worked in cyber, is a category that in cybersecurity is called social engineering. And what this really refers to is how we manipulate people so that we can get the information we need to compromise them. Um, so hackers use social engineering in a variety of ways to try and get passwords, but it goes beyond that. And so I'll, I think the easiest way to explain this is to tell you a real story um, from when I was working at a cybersecurity company. <laughs> so, you know, and I'm certainly not perfect. Uh, I, I think this is really, an, it's an emerging field. It's, it's a work in progress. Um, so I was working at a, a different company in cyber as head of marketing and Back in the day when we could still go to in-person events, my CEO and the head of sales went to work a small trade show in another state. And as any good marketer would do, you know, when they sent me photos of themselves at the booth, I was like, this is great. I'm going to post this on LinkedIn and say, hey, check out our CEO and our head of sales at the booth at this event. If you're there, you know, head over and say hi, that sort of thing. Well, Within less than an hour of me posting that, um, one of the newest employees on our team who was not at the event got an email supposedly from the CEO saying, hey, I'm at this event in Alabama and I need you to go buy several gift cards and electronic gift cards and send them to me because I need them for prospects at this event. And the new employee went and spent a bunch of his own money to get gift cards, to send them ostensibly to the CEO who was at the event. And they went to a hacker instead, or not a hacker, what I would call a malicious actor. It's a term we use in cyber. The, the reason that that was so successful is all that person needed to do in order to compromise the company was look at the LinkedIn post. They knew the name of the CEO. They knew where he was and what he was doing. So he could the person could put together an email to this employee that sounded extremely credible and could also find out from changes on our website who was most recently added or from LinkedIn, who most recently said that they were working at the company. Like it had all the, we laid it all out for them. We made it so easy. And so, you know, the solution there, it's not to stop posting on LinkedIn or to stop posting on Twitter or Facebook. It's to recognize that when you give out that level of information, you're writing the playbook for somebody who, who's interested in exploiting it. And so, in my case, the way I solve for that now as a marketer is if I'm going to make posts like that, I, I'm going to message internally to the company, hey, everybody, the CEO and the head of sales are at this event in Alabama. And oh, by the way, if you, know, if you get any requests for anything unusual, gift cards, et cetera, know that they're not coming from our team. It also helps to have a policy, an across the board policy for things like that, for the CEO saying, I will never call you and ask you to buy gift cards. And if I do call me on my cell phone and verify that it's really me, you know, like, but those are the things that as marketers were never taught. We're taught to share, 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 to be, to post pictures, to give out this kind of information. But we're never really armed with the, the knowledge of the implications it has for how we can be compromised. Oh, the audio just dropped out there at the end. I'm not sure. Uh-oh. No, I was okay. just saying, you're... yeah, I was just saying as marketers, we're never really taught, you know, the implications of all that sharing we're doing on social media. And so we don't, you know, we're not forewarned and forearmed doesn't work if you're not forewarned. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's something that, again, unfortunately, you know, malicious actors, I believe, is the term that you uh, that you use. I'm guessing that's kind of a, an industry term. Uh, I'd call them absolute bastards. Um, but to be honest with you, that's only because of the fact that it's people taking advantage. And that's something that's absolutely awful. There is an element as well, though, of because, again, like you said, we do want to share. We're, we're 
encouraged to share. And I'm the first one to say it. We talk to small business owners on a regular basis to say, tell people what you're doing, get people involved, kind of get that out there. Is there more of a, is it more, sorry, of a case of internally getting the right structures in place, getting the right kind of ways of doing things in place so that these things can't just slip through? Because it's kind of, you know, if you look at the email and if you go into it in depth, and if you're like me, for example, when I receive something that's a little bit skew, if I open up the header information from yeah. the email and I can tell where it's actually coming from and I'm checking the addresses and whatever else. But reality is 90% of people won't do that. So what are the, some of the steps then that people can have internally sort of, I'm not going to say checks and balances, but almost making sure that they're looking after themselves in the best way. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, at the end of the day, people are your biggest weakness, no matter what, like you could have the most secure firewall and uh, VPNs and all of that, but, the, but people are going to be the weakest link in your chain. And so the, there's no perfect solution for it. The best way to tackle that is, is really twofold. One is to have good cybersecurity training for your staff. Um, and there are plenty of online programs that you can put your team through that are really effective that like send them phishing emails, you know, phishing emails being like emails that spoof real emails and try to get you to click on links or to respond or what have you. And, and they'll, they will test you to see if you respond and then they will educate you about here's what you missed in this. So like having that training is really effective, but then also just having policies in place and being, getting ahead of it and saying things like, we will never ask employees to buy gift cards. Or if I ever ask you to spend your own money on anything, call me on my phone before you do it. You know, thinking through those things and, and getting ahead of it and putting out more broad statements and policies is really helpful, but it's not perfect and it can still get through. And I think education is the biggest, you know, the biggest way to tackle it. It is a tough one. And I know that the phishing emails, I often look at these things and think, wow, like, you know, how do these things work? And then I remember that obviously if they're still sending them, then they clearly are working on, on lots of people, unfortunately. Yes, exactly. In terms of, you know, from an internal point of view, obviously we do have things like firewalls and everything else, but for the vast majority of people, what are kind of some of the rules maybe to, to, to the email side of things? You know, for example, if you didn't order it, don't click on it kind of idea, right? It's, you know, your bank will never ask you for your PIN number or your account number over an email. There's lots of little things, but what are some of the real basics that a business can do in terms of their own email policy? Or even if they're, you know, if they're just small, one, two, three member teams, you know, they're not necessarily going to have training and HR to send out these kind of emails, but what are some of the things they can do and, and really kind of train themselves? Yeah, well, believe it or not, I mean, a lot of the online cyber training is very affordable, even and accessible, even to the smallest businesses. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't discount that. Um, and and by the way, we're not selling that, so I'm not saying that for any reason to to promote my company. I, I've been a customer a lot of the of a lot of those services, and they're great. Um, I, again, I think it goes back to awareness and, like you said, um, educating your team about open up the header. Look, and marketers should be savvy enough to know some of these things. Like we understand how email works. You know, we get you can see the from address and you can look at the sending domain and see if it's legitimately from that company. Um, and, and so those are good, good things to start with. I think the other thing is if anybody's ever asking you for your password or asking you to click a link and you're not sure it's legitimate, don't do it from the email, go to the company website. And usually if, if it's legitimate and you have an account there, you're going to have a notification in your account. Um, so, so those are pretty easy, you know, and, and so social email. And then I think really one of the biggest areas of, um, of risk for marketers is the website. Um, you know, that's where so much of our interaction happens these days with customers and prospects. And for a lot of companies, unless you're with a really large company as a marketer, generally you own the website. So it's, to me, that's the area where there's the most, both potential for risk, but also opportunity to like shore up the risk. Well, the audio dropped just slightly there at the end. Apologies. Oh, that's okay. Um, just yeah, just... To... Just saying Seems that the, just drop. the website is, is really, your website is really the, the place where as a marketer, you have the greatest control over, over locking things down. I'll add to that as well, because we, we build websites for companies. We maintain websites for companies and we have a WordPress website, e-commerce for a client. It was going fantastically. We've worked with them since 2017. We've had no issues. 
And there was a vulnerability that has nothing to do with us. It was caught a little bit too late by one of the plugins that we use on a WordPress website. And that's all it took. We had malicious JavaScript that was put in. Uh, it caused an absolute mess. And we, again, all of the clients that we work with have uh, a, an additional firewall built into the WordPress kind of system on purpose to try and mitigate the risks from this. But it can still happen. And before you know it, that email, that domain name, sorry, is pumping out bad emails to people. It's getting flagged as a, as a spam kind of domain. You've got all sorts of risks and problems that come with it. But even mitigating everything and understanding it to a decent degree, you're still not completely invulnerable. And there's always a potential for these things to happen, right? Um, 100%. So, you know, there are lots of tools out there that help you lock down your website and give you some degree of peace of mind. But I am here to tell you, having worked with at some of the cyber companies I've worked at, in fact, there's one that where I worked where we had a, a, a threat intelligence team that came out of the US National Security Agency. And, and when I was looking to redesign the website as head of marketing, I, I was making these proposals for what platform we should build the site on. And, and they, I was tr trying to make the case for WordPress and they were like, no way, it's so insecure. And, and I was like, well, there's a VIP hosting plan that we can go on and all this. And, and it was just funny because essentially what the head of threat intelligence told me who's essentially a white hat hacker, right? Somebody who, who knows how to hack for good. He was like, he's like, basically don't bother. I can hack into anything. And that's the truth. Like if a hacker really wants to get in, there are people out there who can hack into anything. So what I always tell people, I, I don't say that to mean like it's hopeless. I say that to mean, assume that at some point you will be compromised. And so what should you be thinking about when you set up your website? Well, in my opinion, it means you should have like a duplicate backup copy of the site available to restore at the drop of a hat. And there are some hosting platforms like with WordPress, for example, I've always been a big fan of WP Engine as for hosting. It's built specifically for WordPress, you know, and, and when I owned my agency, our site did get hacked. I woke up one morning and there was a picture of, a, of an, an Asian girl on my homepage. And she was saying, you know, ha, I've taken over your site. And I, all I had to do was go into my WP Engine portal and press restore and my site was back up. Um, you know, and so thinking about those things when choosing your host, um, and when setting up your site, I think is really important because you just never know and you can't 100% pre prevent it. Um, you know, so there's, there's the security of your site itself and your ability to restore it. And then there's what, what happens on your site. And so what I mean by that is for better or for worse, the way we build websites today is very much not in a walled garden. So I don't care what platform you're building your site on, odds are there's probably plenty of third-party code executing on that site. Whether you're building it in WordPress and you're using plugins or, you know, you, and there's so much different, so many different types of third-party code. There are browser extensions that your user uses. And, and I think a lot of marketers don't realize this when it comes to browser extensions. If you, you have them as a user, right? You, you have Chrome and you go to the Google web store and you install all these extensions. Maybe they're SEO plugins. Maybe they are um, color pickers. Maybe they are like what we deal with at clean.io is coupon extensions, for example, Honey, Capital One Shopping. Rakuten, what have you, um, all of those browser-based extensions operate at a higher level of permission. So you might think you have control over your website, but actually because those tools are in the user's browser, they are able to still execute code on your site. And it's very hard to control. There is an emerging suite of solutions out there. And that's really where we get into this concept of digital engagement security that allows you to control them. So there are companies out there that will protect your website against bots that will prevent competitor ads from popping up and running on your site. Cause that happens. And it's especially a problem in e-commerce where somebody's visiting your website and all of a sudden a, a competing product ad pops up. Or for example, Amazon assistant, this is really interesting. You might be shopping on an e-commerce store 
And if you have Amazon assistant, it'll pop up and say, we found the same product available on amazon.com for a lower price. So that's falls under the category of customer journey hijacking, where they're trying to basically take someone off of your site who might already be in your shopping cart and get them to go to Amazon. And that plugin runs and has higher permissions to run. You can't stop it. I mean, there are tools now that are coming out to allow you to stop it, but until now it's been really hard. And think about that. That's the equivalent of you, somebody walking into your store and they're getting ready to check out at your cash register and buy something. And somebody else walks in the front door of your store, comes up to that person who's at the cashier and says, come back to my store. I have it cheaper. Can you imagine if somebody did that in the real world? But it happens Fights. online, right? It's crazy. <laughs> it, it's a, I, like I've never even thought about that. And you've mentioned like the... Um the browser extensions, things like Honey and stuff like that. And I only actually discovered Honey for myself a little while ago. Um, and I've actually got it installed as well. I haven't had a huge amount of luck with it. The retailers apparently that I'm buying from haven't like, haven't had any deals or offers or anything else like that that was worthwhile. But all of this, because tech is moving so quickly and within marketing tech, <clears throat> excuse me, marketing tech in particular is moving very, very fast. And we're obviously moving away from third party tracking data uh, and things like that, you know, very soon it will be against the law to sort of track people, at least over here in the EU. Um, and sort of within the next year and a half, it's going to be something that we can't do anymore. So obviously lots of people are trying to find different ways and the whole debacle between Facebook and Apple uh, that's been kind of monopolizing the news for a fair amount of time is another kind of part of that. But actually I don't think, and I, I'll put my hand up, I didn't know anything about these things like you know being able to actually supersede almost your own website because it's in the browser extension and that kind of hierarchy that's crazy like how can yeah. how can small businesses fight against that i mean you've mentioned some tools that are coming up or that are kind of being developed but how could how can people deal with that right now yeah it's when i learned about this my mind was blown as a marketer, it made me so mad because I'm like, are you kidding? In marketing, we talk about our website being an owned asset, meaning we don't own social, right? Facebook owns our social page, but we always say we own our website. So you should focus on your owned assets to then find out that there are these third parties that have the ability to override what you've done on your own asset to me was infuriating. So, so I'll just, I will take one minute and say what we do at clean.io. Cause I think that'll give some context around this. So I started learning about this when I came here because we have two products. One is on the advertising side. Funny enough, you were just talking about cook, uh, Google and cookies and, and things like that. So we've been for the last several years uh, working with large online publishers and advertising platforms. And we have a code that they can put on their site that prevents malvertising, which is basically malicious ads. So we've all experienced it as users. You go to you know a publisher site, you click on an ad and all of a sudden it redirects you someplace you didn't expect to go, or it's a pop-up that comes up saying, you know, you've entered into the sweepstakes or you're taken to a Bitcoin scam. There's a lot of ways it happens. Um, so we pr actually prevent that at runtime. That's our original product. And that's a form of digital engagement security too, because when you think about your users coming to your website and clicking on your ads, like you want to control the user experience on your site. And for a publisher, their users are their business. Like that's what they're monetizing. So that's super important. And it was actually because of our work on that side of the business that we learned about this issue with coupon extensions. We started, we, we look at the JavaScript that executes on our customer sites and we started seeing what are called client side injections. And that's just a very fancy cybersecurity way of saying the client side, which is the user side, meaning the user visited your site and has something in their computer or in their browser that is injecting code on your website. In this case, it is the browser extension, like I was describing. So one of the biggest client side injections are these coupon extensions. And so we're building a new product that will allow online retailers to block the coupon extensions from auto injecting codes at checkout. So, cause what they do is they basically, if I have it in my browser and I go to a website and I legitimately type in a promo code that I've been given, it will then scrape that code and give it to everybody. And where I get outraged, cause we see this data in our platform is I see coupon codes like military hero 50. So somebody is wants to give military heroes 50% off, but now these coupon extensions are giving that code to everyone. So the first 
problem with that is uh, I'm outraged, right? Like, again, going back to my analogy of being in the real world, I would never walk into a restaurant and say, by the way, I'm in the army. Can I have a discount? And even they may have a military discount, but I would not lie about my own military service. And I would hope that most people would be outraged at the thought of that. But for some reason, we think, think it's okay to take advantage of that when it's a digital coupon. So there's that issue. But beyond that, here's where it gets scary for marketers. You know, usually if you're a business and you're using a coupon code or, or something along those lines, you're doing it as part of a campaign and maybe you've advertised on a podcast or maybe you've said, subscribe to my newsletter and I'll give you 10% off. You're banking on the fact that when somebody uses that code, A, it's they've taken the action for which you've offered the code. So maybe subscribe to your newsletter or B, they've come through the channel where you've made the code available. What happens with coupon extensions is you can no longer trust your own data because they're giving the code out to everybody. So how do you know if, that podcast where the code was mentioned really drove the traffic. How do you know if somebody subscribed to your newsletter? Even worse and scariest of all is if you're doing affiliate marketing, how do you know if the sale came from that affiliate? And oh, by the way, you might be paying that affiliate a percentage of the sale that they didn't even drive. So the whole thing is just kind of mind blowing to me. I mean, can you tell I'm a little passionate about it, but it is, it is, it has big implications for us as marketers. I think it's huge. And again, I, when I came into this conversation, I was completely blank, like in terms of, I didn't really know much about this space. Uh, and I've been lucky enough to talk to a couple of cybersecurity experts over the years through work. Um, some ex FBI people, in fact, in the U S who were fascinating. I could just sit there and listen to the stories for hours on end, but it's the, in the marketing sense of it, this is crazy. And it can also be semi detrimental to a small business, right? Because if you're giving a big discount because you want to honor military heroes and suddenly anybody who's on your website is getting access to that code, you might be willing to sell something. I'm not going to say at a loss, but maybe without making any money because it's for a very specific small set of people and that you've been very careful how you got that code to the right kind of people. And it then becoming something that's available to mass market in that sense could actually destroy a business. Like Chris, you want to hear a terrifying story just to your point? I don't know. I'm scared <laughs> now, Kathleen. <laughs> oh, don't be scared. No, because we're fixing this. But but my CEO do, talks to a lot of online retailers as part of our us launching this new product. Like we're trying to learn, we're getting feedback. And what he does before he talks to them is he goes to their site and he'll often make a purchase and he'll, he has all these coupon extensions in his browser and he does it as part of the research process to see what, what the extent of the problem is. So he went to a major online men's fashion retailer website and discovered that one of the coupon extensions was giving out a coupon for $75 off your purchase. And there was no minimum spend amount. So he was able to make, I think it was like six purchases of under $75 each and get every single thing he bought for free. And, you know, thank God because he's ethical and because we stand on the side of the retailer, he immediately contacted the retailer and said, oh, by the way, this is happening and you should know about it. And then he returned everything he ordered. And then he went and paid for the things he, you know, that he got, because it was really just for research. But that is like the worst case scenario. And of course, I'm sure that slipped through. I'm sure that was somebody's mistake. They forgot to put a minimum threshold on that coupon, or maybe it was for a very you know specific use case, but the coupon extensions make that available to anyone and you're giving your product away for free. That's insane. Like it's, it's absolutely crazy. insane. I didn't know about the scraping of the, co the coupon codes and stuff. Um, and that is just outrageous. And I think obviously just to put everyone that's listening at ease, if you're a smaller business, the chances of, potentially, you know, having thousands of orders that suddenly come through that do this is slim. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily the, the, the extensions that are going to push traffic in the first place, but it is interesting to start understanding that as a model and realizing just how detrimental that could actually be. So, you know, what are some of the things in my head, I'm already thinking, you know, some of the safety nets that people could implement, but I'm thinking things like, you know, run it for a very short period of time. 
update your codes fairly regularly so that you can see if there's any of this kind of malicious behavior, as it were. But what are, am I on the right tracks? What are some of the things that people can do? Yeah. So, you know, there's a variety of ways to come at this problem. Obviously, you know, we're building a solution. It's, it's essentially right now it's only available for Shopify plus users, but we're building a solution to stop that problem, to basically disable extensions from, from scraping and auto injecting, but it's not available to everyone right now. And so, um, you know, there are a couple of things we've talked to retailers, number one, who have actually stopped using affiliate marketing for this reason, because they can't control their codes and they're worried they're paying out to affiliates when they, they haven't earned the money. Um, I hate to recommend that because that's tough, but if you're going to do affiliate marketing, maybe instead of giving out coupon codes, you give out a unique link to a landing page and anybody who comes through that link, you can track to your affiliate. It's thinking through things like that. That's a little harder to, to fake, right? Um, if you are using coupon codes, it's about, um, keeping a really close eye on redemption patterns. If you all of a sudden see a huge spike, then it, that probably indicates that your codes have, have been scraped and are, are in one of these systems. Um, or, you know, sometimes it happens because that's the day your, your influencer made a big post. Like you just need to know what's happening in your ecosystem and spot when something unusual is going on. Um, and, and just to have a tight lid on the codes you're using, you know, a lot of, most marketers use platforms to generate these codes, uh, or, or hopefully have a tracking system for them. And, and however, I would say I have seen plenty of companies where they're either using multiple platforms to generate codes, or there's different people involved in the system of creating them. And so sometimes that's when things get out of control is when the right hand isn't talking to the left, you don't know what codes are out there. So having a good system for tracking them, keeping an eye on them and acting quickly to shut them down as soon as you see anything amiss is really important. That's absolutely fantastic. Kathleen, where can people find out more about this? Where can people kind of dig a little bit deeper? Uh, and I include myself in this. Uh, <laughs> any, any recommended places to read or to start looking at? Sure. I mean, we are writing a lot about these things on our website at clean.io. Um, but I will say there's not a lot out there on this topic. And that's something we're hoping to try and change. You know, there is information out there on cybersecurity, but to be candid, it can be very overwhelming as a marketer. And a lot of it is geared towards a very technical audience. And so I think that's really been part of the problem is that marketers haven't had uh, approachable content that teaches them about this. So, um, you know, Try Googling, see what's out there. I think I think the most important thing is to just really be conscious of the choices you're making and think through the implications they have. It's an education process. And hopefully over time, we'll be able to help um, do our part to educate the marketplace a little bit more. Kathleen, thank you so much because I've learned a ton and I've got some things to think about and talk to clients about. Um, but before that happens, uh, how can people find you online? How can people connect with you? Sure. So um, you can find me uh, on, on the clean.io website. I have a personal website, kathleen-booth.com. Um, I am outside of work. I'm the host of the Inbound Success Podcast. So you'll, you'll find me there. And I pretty much, LinkedIn is my place. I, I accept connection requests from anybody. So if you do want to chat, just find me on LinkedIn and send me a connection request and I will definitely accept it. Kathleen, thank you so much. This was a ton of fun, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure, and I hope everyone learned something from this, because I definitely did. Yeah.